I think we're going to do questions at the end. And so at this point, I'm going to switch over and introduce Bill Belleville. And uh, this is, gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Bill. Um, he's been in town now for a couple of days and uh, giving lectures to various groups around town and one more tomorrow and then we're, we're finally going to turn him loose. Uh, I first became aware of Bill when he wrote a book called River of Lakes. And uh, it's a story about the St. John's River and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We got to know each other a little bit since then. He's written another book called Losing All to Sprawl and then his most recent book is called Salvaging the Rural Florida. Um, I highly recommend them to you for reading. I have discovered in terms of reading it and talking to Bill that he grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland along the Chesapeake Bay. I grew up in North Virginia, so we have some commonality. Uh, also discovered that one of his favorite places out is one of mine, which is the Galapagos Islands. We've been down there several times. But Bill has developed a real keen sense of place and as a writer and um, person involved in the humanities. Um, I was struck the other night, we were talking, and he made a comment to one of my classes that um, writers have to be observers. And I thought back to my seventh grade science teacher who had taught me that scientists are good observers. And I thought it really does sort of tie it all together, that that's all part of being science and writers and putting it all together. So, Bill Belleville. Thank you. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to move here to a place where I don't wrench my neck when I try to read the screen. St. John's River, 500 years of magic, myth, and mayhem. And I think we have it all right there in this one shot. So metaphorically, you've got your magic, <clears throat> which is alligators that are about 40 feet long, uh, as rendered by Jacques Lemoyne. You have the myth, and you have uh, the Tamuqua gaily running around poking logs into the alligators, and of course you have mayhem. We have all that today too, except we have a more sophisticated version of, of, that, whole, um, of that whole metaphor. About 12 years ago, I was, um, I was working on a Discovery Channel project, and they asked me if I would retrace where William Bartram had been in the southeast, and primarily on the St. John's River. And I began to poke around, and I realized there had been very little written about the St. John's. And what had been written was sort of scattered through time. And I thought, well, wow, this is going to be a pretty cool book, but it seems to be a very complex river system. So I proposed the book to a publisher, and I start to research the book, knowing all the while that I'm going to, it's going to be a big, big learning curve because this is an incredibly, uh, it's an old river historically. Biologically, it, it's, it's very, very complex and diverse. And I figured, well, I've been on the river different places. I've been diving in some of the caves. I've been kayaking. I've been fly fishing. So I, I've got a bit of an emotional investment in it already. But I make a point to start to talk to folks who knew a lot about the river. And I was told along the part of the river where I live, which is upstream about 150 miles from here, Sanford on, on Lake Monroe, I was told there was a fellow there that knows everything there is to know about that part of the river. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go and chat with him. So I go over to his house, and he's a commercial fisherman, and go past and he shows me his traps and his buoys, and we sit down, and he says, when I was a little boy, I saw a hippopotamus on the St. John's River. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a lot more difficult to tell than I realized. <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, I'm probably in the wrong place because maybe he doesn't understand I'm writing nonfiction and, and not kind of a made-up book. And, and he gives me the details of the hippopotamus and come to find out there was a traveling circus that passed through Sanford back in the 1930s. And lo and behold, a hippopotamus breaks out of its cage and because it's a water-loving animal, heads for the river. And people tr had spent two or three days trying to get out of the river and people saw a hippopotamus in the river. So that helped me a lot in approaching the idea of almost anything is possible. Let folks talk, see what they have to say, and then try to see how it fits into the, to the broader story itself. Marjorie Kenan Rollins, as, as I began to learn from folks who have been on the river, who've written about the watershed before me, 
uh, I found that Rollins was a person who did have a precise way of identifying what she saw around her. And back in a time, back in the 1930s and 1940s, when people would randomly come to Florida and make stuff up, because Florida still wasn't that well known, Rollins was trying very hard to understand how places in the landscape worked, how the big scrub worked, how the rivers worked, how the swamps and springs worked. And her powers of observation, as Quint mentioned, observation was key. I've always said to become a better writer, become a better observer. And certainly if you're wanting to become a better a person who understands a complex natural system or you want to spend time with observation, whether you're observing what somebody else has written, whether you're out in nature and paying attention to the actual experience itself. Rollins writes, I don't know how one can live without some small place of enchantment to turn to. This is at the heart of what I care a lot about. It's natural history, certainly. It's cultural history, which is very much influenced by natural history, by, by geography. But it's a nexus in between where we have the chance to find discovery. Humans really need this, this sense of enchantment in their heart. A lot of folks write about how deeply that, that need exists. And when we, are, we allow ourselves to go into nature, to go out into the natural systems of the prevailing uh, natural features where we live, we, we, ha we have an opportunity for those moments. We have opportunity for discovery. We hear discovery in, in real life. We have an old colorized postcard of Silver Springs on the left, another colorized postcard of the boats that travel across the water. As a little boy, eight years old, I came to Florida with my family, visiting my granddad who lived down by Wachula, and this was pre-Disney, and most of the tourist attractions were built around natural places. So we got on the glass bottom boat and cruised atop the, the springs there. And I looked down and I'm thinking, man, this is, I've never seen anything like this. I've got to come back, you know? And I did. I came back and I dove one day in that spring as an adult. But that first sense of enchantment was probably more powerful than almost anything else in drawing me back to this place. <clears throat> this allows us going to places such as Silver Springs, going to any spring in Florida, and, and in a place that has more springs than any other region in the world, have well over a thousand springs that have been identified, another several hundred that have not quite been identified yet, but people know about them. Springs allow us the opportunity to transport our senses under the water, through the surface, so it gives us an entirely new dimension where we can perceive, we can, we can experience, we can allow that experience to settle itself down on our soul. These are Florida spotted gar in the run of Blue Spring. Blue Spring, is, as you all know, if you've read some of Bartram, and Bartram's travels published in 1791, he stopped at several springs along the Grand and Noble San Juan, and he was very touched and affected and moved by his experiences there. He wrote about Blue Spring, he wrote about Salt Spring, uh, and some of his letters he, he wrote about Silver Glen and of course uh, Manatee Spring on the Suwannee River. Sometimes I think of me as an old manatee, so we, of course, mythology and, and imagination goes beyond what we know as traditional literature and it expands in, into popular culture. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote that Florida Springs are bowls of liquid light, and if you've spent any time around springs, you will understand exactly what she means. Springs are, are a big part of our St. John system. The system itself at its headwaters is driven by, by a flowing, a flowing river through sawgrass. Very much looks like the headwaters of the Everglades itself. You have to stand in the sawgrass for a while to understand that water is actually moving. As the river courses northward, it begins to change and transform from an open prairie to more of a hardwood swamp, and the springs begin to appear along the river and very much uh, affect the biological diversity as well as the enchantment 